So thank you for joining us uh, today for a conversation around the new statement uh, released by the Baha'i International Community's uh, United Nations Office uh, to mark the 75th anniversary uh, of the UN this year. Um, uh, we have with us today uh, Augusto Lopez Claros, uh, Arthur Dahl, and Maya Groff from the Global Governance Forum, um, which is a forum that promotes research on improved or, or alternative models of um, global governance um, in different areas such as peace and security, the environment, um, economic development, and the rule of law. Um, the group um, won the New Shape Prize for their proposal titled Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. Um, this was a prize uh, that was intended to uh, stimulate thinking on um, a new development um, of, of development of new global structures and institutions. Um, so before I give the floor to them, I just wanted to share a few comments about the statement um, that was released by the Baha'i International Community titled a Go Governance Befitting Humanity and the Path Toward a Just Global Order. Um, this year's anniversary has uh, provided an opportunity to um, world leaders, member states, and also civil society organizations who have been engaged with the United Nations over the past decades to reflect on the United Nations, its accomplishments, the learning and the steps to take uh, in the years ahead. And so the Baha'i International Community uh, has also um, had the opportunity to um, to have this reflection and share its uh, contributions in this new statement. Uh, when the United Nations was established in 1945, uh, the member states declared their determination, as it says in the uh, preamble of the UN Charter, uh, uh, their determination to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And so the UN was established to try and make a more peaceful world. And in fact, the establishment of the UN um, has been one of the few historical moments uh, in the past hundred years or so where it seemed at least even for a brief moment um, that humanity was uh, finally reaching uh, lasting or real peace. Uh, although we see now in uh, the current state of the world uh, that this hope has not uh, been actualized, but the establishment of the UN uh, did give glimmerings of hope um, to the international community. It demonstrated uh, the willingness of governments to create a new system of international order and to endow this institution uh, with the peacekeeping authority um, that was denied the international community in the past. It also has provided a forum uh, for many to express their concerns um, and the problems that most deeply affects them and has opened uh, participation to a wide range of states and institutions that did not have this opportunity in the past. Um, and I guess above all, uh, despite all of its shortcomings, it has uh, been a space, a new authority that's been established to address global concerns, challenges, and inequalities. So in this uh, statement that's been released by the BIC, um, while uh, the BIC acknowledges the importance of the emergence of the United Nations as a system of international governance, uh, it also reminds us of the long path ahead and how the new realities and the new challenges are pushing institutions to new stages of development. And this idea that at each stage in human history, uh, more complex levels of integration are necessary in order to address new problems and new concerns and new challenges. Um, there are various important um, ideas in this booklet, but I wanted to highlight one main theme that is really the running theme throughout uh, the statement. Uh, which is the idea that throughout history, times of difficulty and turbulence present opportunities for growth and opportunities to redefine our collective values. 
um, and the values that, that underlie many of the policies and the actions that we take. And so the statement asks, asks us to reflect on one important idea, which is, uh, which is the oneness of humanity and it's the, in, the connected principle of the interdependence of humanity and, and global interdependence. And um, uh, this profound concept uh, or these two profound concepts really require deep reflection regarding their implications uh, for efforts at every level, local, national and international. And uh, in one place, uh, the statement says regarding uh, these two ideas um, that deceptively simple, this principle implies a profound reordering of priorities. Too often, advancement of the common good is approached as a secondary objective, commendable, but to be pursued only after other narrower national interests have been secured. This must change for the welfare of any segment of humanity is inextricably bound up with the welfare of the whole. And, and it goes on to talk about how the starting point for any consultation, any program, any policy uh, needs to be um, the question of how it affects other segments of society. Um, and the fact that um, when considering the merits of any action, any policy, world leaders uh, and policymakers should ask this critical question of will this decision advance the good of humankind in its entirety? And if we think about how uh, just asking this simple but profound question uh, can uh, impact many of the current laws and policies that are currently uh, in place in society and what would happen if oneness of humankind actually became uh, the guiding principle of, of many of these actions and policies. Uh, so with that, um, I will uh, give the floor to first to uh, Mr. Augusto Lopez Cleros. He's an international economist with over 30 years of experience in uh, different international organizations such as the World Bank and the World Economic Forum. Um, and I will give him the floor, please. Um, thank you, Seiming. Thank you very much for your nice introduction. Um, I wanted to share with you some thoughts and some reflections um, that caught my attention as I read the statement and that I think resonated with me very powerfully. Um, at the very beginning, there is a reference to, to the current pandemic and the possibilities that uh, often crises open up for uh, marked social change and how this in turn can precipitate perhaps a move towards greater degree of stability in the world and processes that are going to, as the statement says, enrich the lives of, of inhabitants. And I just wanted to share with you some examples uh, which for me recently have illustrated very much this dynamic of crisis and opportunity. Uh, and obviously in some of the thoughts that I will share with you, you know, I come to them as, a, as an economist, as somebody who has been working on issues of economic development for the better part of his professional career. But one of the things that has struck me is how the, the crisis has shown how relatively unprepared we are uh, in terms of uh, the quality of our, of our public health systems. Even in the case of high income countries, you know, we have found ourselves in the middle of, of, of uh, um, a crisis partly precipitated by our unpreparedness for, for, for something like, like the pandemic. And I, I took much interest in a response of the Spanish government to the crisis where they immediately set up a commission of experts that are going to advise the government as to the kinds of reforms and measures which need to be taken so that the next time around, when we face the next pandemic or some other systemic shock to, this, to the system, the government will be better prepared to face it and not face the kinds of, uh, the kinds of stress, stresses and tests that they have had to face uh, in, the last, in the last six months. So that's one, one aspect. The other 
has to do with the kind of rethinking that is taking place in the world today about spending priorities. I think that all of a sudden governments are, are, have decided or ha are realizing that the way that we have allocated the resources of the state uh, involves a lot of a lot of inefficiencies and and misplaced priorities. And so one hears, for instance, the need to redefine security now more in terms of social and economic uh, uh, welfare, the welfare of the people, rather than to think of security strictly in militaristic terms, which is what we have tended to do at least since the United Nations was created in, in 1945. And I think this is a potentially very good development. Um, and then the third area that comes to mind uh, is, is the extent to which uh, governments now are beginning to actively talk about uh, universal basic income, something that was not happening in prior years. Because now people realize that it is actually in the collective self-interest you know, to provide some kind of universal safety net that, that provides access to all of humanity to some basic services, you know, such as health, uh, uh, food, uh, uh, education, and so on. And, and again, I think this, this is, uh, for me, a very uh, salutary development, uh, especially if we focus in the initial stages on, you know, countries that are particularly poor, particularly vulnerable, where we have the largest um, um, pockets of poverty, of illiteracy, of malnutrition in the world. So that's one general area. The statement um, says that the United Nations remains the largest forum. Uh, it brings together 193 countries to give expression to humanity's common will, to quote from the statement, but then they go on and say that the current arrangements are no longer sufficient. And to me, um, this is a very accurate reflection of the kind of world that we live in today. Um, and I, again, here, I wanna give you a few examples, which I think very much illustrate this, this, this idea that is, that is present in the statement in a number of ways about the inadequacy of the institutions that we have today. Well, one that comes to mind, of course, is the global financial crisis in 2009, which showed how uh, regulation and prudential oversight of the financial system was deeply flawed. And as a result of that, you know, we had a near implosion of the global financial system. Um, that in turn has precipitated some, some uh, uh, reforms in the system. And at least as of now, although as they say, touch wood, you know, the, this economic crisis precipitated by, by COVID, you know, has not, has not uh, sort of transmuted into a financial crisis yet. And, and we certainly hope that it won't. Um, a second example has to do with our approach to managing climate change, um, which is, you know, I think is recognized as being the most important challenge facing uh, the world today, but where governments have essentially adopted an architecture that is very flawed, um, consisting of uncoordinated voluntary arrangements, which in, involve a, a lot of free riding and, and, and are just not working, not working. A Nobel laureate, William Norhouse, recently said that, that the global effort to curb climate change is sure to fail. Uh, and I, I think he's actually a very credible source because he's one of the, the world's leading authorities on the economics of, of climate change. And then, of course, a third example is rising inequality, uh, which, which is it, 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 uh, sort of manifesting itself in many parts of the world in increasing levels of social and political unrest. And, and, and so these are examples to me, which I think very clearly, very eloquently highlight the point illustrated in the statement that refers to this gap between the UN being uh, a center of, of global cooperation, but its current structures being inadequate to the task at present. And then finally, let me give you one more, one more uh, area where I thought that the statement was particularly insightful. I was especially happy with the reference to the World Parliamentary Assembly as a practical way, and I quote, to strengthen the legitimacy of co and connection of people 
with that gr uh, global body. In the book, um, which you referred to in your introductory remarks, Arthur, Maya, and myself, argue that this uh, World Parliamentary Assembly is something that could be established um, without amending the charter. In other words, it doesn't require uh, jumping over a very, very large uh, bar. Um, it can be done under Article 22 of the, of the UN Charter, which gives the General Assembly authority to establish subsidiary organs, which are necessary for the performance of its functions. Um, I, I, I find it particularly significant that the statement highlights this as one very potential, very fruitful area of reform in the near term. Um, and here, perhaps, um, what I like to say is that this has been done before. Um, in 1958, the six founding members of the European Union created the European Parliamentary Assembly, um, which in, in the initial stages had a largely advisory role to the, to, the, to the member countries. By June of 1979, this body, which was initially made up of 142 parliamentarians from the six founding members of the United Nations, of, of the European uh, uh, communities, by 1979, they moved to popular vote, which established a much stronger linkage between the, the European countries and the the, the peoples the, 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 that, that they were representing. And of course, since then, it has grown to over 700 members, 27 countries, and acquired a much great deal of authority in very important areas of European law. And so there has been a kind of a half a century transition from a body that was set out, you know, with the idea of creating or strengthening the legitimacy of European Union institutions to a body today, the European Parliament, which is very much at the center of legislation and the rule of law within the European Union. So for me, <clears throat> um, I, was, I was especially pleased to see this reference in the statement because I think illustrates one area where reform could happen uh, in the relatively shorter term. I have other ideas, but I think I will stop here because I'm looking at my watch and, and uh, um, this, is, this has been long enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augusto, for um, very interesting comments. Uh, we will have a chance to to also, you know, ask each other questions uh, after everybody's comments. So um, I will go to the next speaker, um, Ms. Maya Groff. Uh, she's an international lawyer who is based in The Hague. Uh, she has assisted in the development and servicing of multilateral treaties. Um, has worked at various international criminal courts and also teaches regularly at the Hague Ac Academy of International Law. So with that, I will pass it to you, Maya. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Simin, and thanks to you and your colleagues for inviting us here and congratulations on this wonderful and inspiring statement on the occasion of the United Nations 75th anniversary. It's really an incredible anniversary. <laughs> um, and just a very short disclaimer that I'm speaking now in my personal capacity, inspired by the Global Governance Forum, but not on behalf of any institution. So as Augusto noted, there are really so many good, uh, very helpful perspectives in this statement. It's a relatively short statement, but very rich. So it's difficult to choose <laughs> what to focus on for, for first short comments. But uh, the first thing that really leaps out to me is the notion of human possibility and capability. There's a thread also of very, very positive vision uh, for humanity and for our uh, ability to solve our global challenges that runs throughout the document. So um, it, it, it highlights also, we, we have this capacity to make good choices, <laughs> to take, take a very positive path. Also, uh, as Augusto noted in this time, and the statement notes, in this time of crisis, we also have perhaps a unique opportunity as, as we're, we're more aware of our inter interdependence, of, of the shared global risks that are, that are really um, th 
threatening our common future. And as one example, as you noted, Seaman, in, in your introductory, uh, introductory remarks, if we collectively really fundamentally and finally, at last, <laughs> understand our commonality as a really interdependent global community that embraces all peoples and nations around the world, um, that if we, if we have this clear acknowledgement of our essential unity as humanity, one humanity, this opens up a whole new set of possibilities as we start to contemplate uh, these grave challenges and, and very uh, rather existential risks, as Augusto was mentioning with climate change, for example, ecological collapse, plus this pandemic, more, more pandemics, um, uh, global economic fragility, uh, also accelerating military contests. These all represent really grave risks that threaten us all. But if we really allow this notion to sink in of our essential unity as, as a human species, if we put it in the forefront of our minds, it opens up whole new vistas of problem solving uh, for us uh, at the global level. And one of the themes of the Geneva Peace Week is renewing peace. And I think this statement gets to the heart of a shift in perspective that can allow us to renew our commitment to the extraordinary core values that are in the UN Charter of 1945. For example, to quote again for the preamble, to practice tolerance and to live uh, together side by side in peace with one another as good neighbors. Imagine if we really practiced that at the international level and really took that to heart. Um, not only to reaffirm our commitment to the principles in the Charter, as you note in the statement, but then also, as you note, to prepare ourselves for the processes of rethinking our current global governance infrastructure in a more technical and concrete way to further the core charter values that are already there. Uh, but as Augusto mentioned, he mentioned one proposal in the statement about a parliamentary, some kind of global parliamentary assembly. He makes some other very concrete proposals um, as we do in, in the book uh, that we, the three of us co-authored that Augusto mentioned. Uh, and also in terms of process, international processes, um, I think this is so important. Uh, and I just want to quote the, the statement uh, briefly. So quote, our deliberative processes will need to be more magnanimous, reasoned and cordial motivated not by attachment to entrenched positions and narrow interests, but by a collective search for deeper understanding of complex issues, moving beyond ingrained habits of contest and blame." End quote. So again, this, this is such an important cultural shift uh, that we can uh, be aware of, that we can we can try to call for at the international level, <laughs> that again will open new problem-solving capacities. But we can also all practice these qualities of having a truly consultative, uh, uh, honest, cordial <laughs> uh, process to to figure out solutions to our global challenges. So. If we can really internalize this perspective fully about the oneness of humanity, as the statement notes, uh, it really holds a promise of new human potentials to solve these very serious issues we're, we're confronting uh, in a time of peril. Um, but not only to solve our problems, our serious problems, but also for new unprecedented global achievements. Uh, for example, much, much higher levels of shared prosperity, economic flourishing, environmental flourishing, new levels of peace and security at the international level. I don't think we should understate or underestimate if we uh, have this perspective, the new heights we can reach uh, globally. So to, to just round off my comments, uh, if we do begin to think in these different ways that are put forth by the statement, uh, you could even say that success, global success, becomes inevitable. <laughs> right now, there's a lot of pessimism because of, of, of the narratives um, of division, 
and uh, these cultures of contest, which are so unhelpful when we have problems that we must really solve uh, cooperatively. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, very interesting. I could really listen to all of you for much longer. <laughs> Um, but alas, we have a short time. Um, I will now uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Arthur Dahl, uh, who is uh, the president of the International Environment Forum and a retired senior officer of UN Environment. And he has over 50 years of experience in the areas of sustainability, international environmental assessment and government uh, governance. Uh, ha and has also uh, has 20 years of experience working in inter intergovernmental organizations. So with that, I pass you the floor, Arthur. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Simon. I'd like you as an environmental scientist to explore how the statement addresses renewing peace with our planet. We need to respond to these new threats to peace and security that did not exist in 1945 other than war including economic warfare, which seems to be increasing today, conflict over resources, such as oil and gas in the South China Sea or the Eastern Mediterranean, or even say ocean, ocean fisheries, where you have widespread and intensive illegal fishing, wiping out fish stocks in the, in the open ocean. Then there are the environmental drivers of conflict, such as climate change. Drought was in fact, one of the causes of the crisis in Syria as people in rural areas were forced into the towns because their crops failed. And of course, there's a resulting increase in migration, which is bound to accelerate with more drought, crop failures, and rising sea levels. As the statement points out, these are demonstrating our interconnection and interdependence, pushing us to redefine our collective values and assumptions, and calling for higher levels of social and political unity. More complex levels of integration become not only possible, but necessary. New and more pressing challenges emerge with cascading and increasingly interconnected threats. That's not one problem. These are all the other. For instance, the pandemic is demonstrating how a health crisis leads to an economic crisis precipitating a social crisis, impacting the poor and those with the least resilience. The statement highlights the need to live within environmentally sustainable limits as genuine partners in the stewardship of the planet and in securing the prosperity of its peoples. Purposefully organizing our affairs in full consciousness of ourselves as one people in one shared homeland. The environmental crisis is pushing us to an acknowledgement of our global interdependence, as we see that the welfare of any segment of humanity is inextricably bound up with the welfare of the whole. This calls for a renewal of global civic ethics enshrined in the UN Charter and subsequent agreements with both the pandemic and the environment showing that those living in poverty are at the greatest risk. We cannot afford to be indifferent to the suffering of so many. As the statement points out, this requires a process-oriented approach to progress. Too much of the present global system of environmental governments is voluntary. Even the commitments under the Paris Agreement are far from adequate to, to save us from global climate catastrophe. The best efforts of some are neutralized, if not reversed, by the contrary actions of others, driven by national or economic self-interest. The statement is quite specific, and I quote, strengthening the legal framework relating to the natural world would lend coherence and vigor to the biodiversity, climate, and environmental regimes, and provide a robust foundation for a system of common stewardship of the planet's resources. In fact, perhaps this is an area with the most potential 
to make a breakthrough in global governance. Just as the European Union began with a coal and steel community, creating a mechanism to legislate globally for climate change might increase trust and lay the foundation for wider efforts to renew peace in the world. Science is showing us the problems and calling for rapid action. But rethinking every, every dimension of our society and economy to make the transition to sustainability as defined in the Sustainable Development Goals is still a great challenge. The statement calls for experimentation, search, innovation, and creativity within a moral framework. At least with modern technology uniting the world, collaboration is possible on scales undreamt of in past ages. However, with our increasing interdependence on technologies without a moral framework, increasing our vulnerabilities, any failure would be potentially catastrophic. And that's really the challenge we're facing now. Can we avoid the catastrophes on the horizon? Our only rational and ethical choice is to focus on building this new global order necessary to draw back from climate change, biodiversity collapse, and other existential threats immediately ahead. I hope that in this Geneva Peace Week, we'll explore these issues and this state will inspire people to go forward and start working on solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. Very interesting. Um, so maybe there have been questions in the course of these um, comments and I think everybody should um, feel free to ask. Um, one of the questions that has come up for me in reading the statement and also listening to you, um, in one place the statement talks about uh, the idea of state sovereignty. So it says, uh, whatever benefits have accrued from past conceptions of state sovereignty, present conditions demand a far more holistic and coherent approach to analysis and decision making. Um, Augusto also spoke about a uh, world parliamentary system. And I wanted to just ask, you know, in your experience um, and your expertise and also reading the statement, uh, how feasible do you think this idea of a world parliamentary system is that, that it recommends in the statement? And I know I was spoke a little bit about this um, and experience in Europe as well, but I just wanted to kind of uh, see if we can unpack this idea a little bit more. Simin, perhaps I can I can start since um, since um, the World Parliamentary Assembly was part of my my remarks. Um, in the book, um, we we present broadly speaking two types of reforms, things that can be done in the short term uh, that are reachable, feasible um, within the current. Um, legal structure that we have in the in the United Nations, and then more longer term reforms that that basically would require, for instance, amendments to the to the UN Charter, right? which which is largely perceived as being a very tall order. Uh, certainly, at this particular moment in history, um, uh, I think that probably there is no political will among the major shareholders of the United Nations to do this, which of course doesn't mean that, you know, with changes in the world and with crises coming our way in, 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 in coming years, this won't change. It could very well change. It could change dramatically, quickly. Right? And so the, the World Parliamentary Assembly is something that can be done in, in the short term because the, the UN Charter actually gives the General Assembly the ability to establish supporting organs. And, and they have done that in the, in, in, you know, throughout, the, throughout the history of the, of the UN. So it's not something that, that has no precedent. But for, for us, it is a very important way, as the, as the, let, as the statement says, of enhancing the le legitimacy of the United Nations, establishing a, a stronger connection between, between the, the organization itself, which is largely made 
of diplomats, you know, the General Assembly, the members of the General Assembly are diplomats representing the, the, current, the current party in power in their, in their respective country. Um, whereas if you were to have people that are, are, are either from parliaments or, or ideally democratically elected in their own countries, then those people would actually be much closer in, uh, uh, to, the, to the people themselves and therefore representing in a, in a, in a, in a better way um, the will of those, of those people. We think that this kind of arrangement would have other collateral effects, which would be very favorable to the system. For instance, with people who are members of the parliamentary assembly representing their respective citizens, uh, rather than the party in power, you could have these people perhaps uh, have a much, uh, uh, taking on a much broader set of issues for discussion. They would be uh, very much closely identified with working on issues of human rights, of the environment, of gender, of inequality. As, happen as has happened in the European Parliament, you could have coalitions of members aligning not along citizenship criteria, but rather along issues. Um, Parliamentarians from numerous different countries working together on issues of, of environmental sustainability or, or, or human rights. And for us, you know, this is a very important potential development because it changes the, the mental framework from simply thinking in terms of the interests of the nation state and going one step beyond and beginning to think in, in broader issues that are a concern to the whole international community. Perhaps I could add something with respect to the issue of national sovereignty, because I think you know, while that may have made sense in the 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, it has eroded today. How can a nation truly be sovereign when it has no control over its economy? You know, when so many things happen from outside to impact us, as we saw with the financial crisis. And in many other areas as well, you know, what used to be sovereignty, you know, is now held much as much by private corporations or other actors as it is by governments themselves. So in a sense, strengthening the structures of global governance will actually protect national autonomy and diversity. And it's one of the things the statement brings forth very strongly, the importance of maintaining this wonderful diversity of systems of government and different approaches and cultures around the world, not trying to go for uniformity. And so I think there's a there's an evolution of thinking there that people clinging to sovereignty need to really say that what they, they're clinging to no longer exists and to protect their, those, the things they want most, they need to go to the, in this broader framework to protect those values. One other point with respect to this legislation, the, the General Assembly of Diplomats is not well designed to draft legislation as parliamentarians are. Parliamentarians, you know, their role is to prepare legislation. And clearly, we need mechanisms to legislate that brings in scientific advice and you know, draft and really and so on, other kinds of, of, of talents, of whether this comes from part assembly or whether there might be a, a more focused area, say, that I suggested on, on climate change. We need laws urgently with respect to, to climate change that bring science and lawmaking together, looking at the common interest, you know, to bring us both back from climate change. So I think we're opening discussions here on things that can be seen very constructively, not as a threat, but as important steps forward to preserving our fundamental interests. Yeah, exactly. And and just just to build on, on those comments um, and maybe speaking to your question about um, the feasibility or how realistic would you know a potential world parliamentary assembly or some of the other recommendations, your concrete recommendations, you're making the statement I think there are some interesting uh, windows of opportunity opening at the moment. I would commend to everybody who's, who's, who's watching to look at the rather hopeful and very positive uh, statement adopted by the UN General Assembly on the occasion of uh, the UN 75th anniversary. 
that is reaffirming the values of the charter, that is devoting and dedicating all of those states of the UN, members of the UN, to thinking about reform, to thinking about the international rule of law, a whole range of incredibly important uh, core values issues that are in that statement. So <laughs> I think you see uh, among the majority of states around the world, um, a very clear will to work together cooperative, cooperatively, despite you know, um, larger powers seeming to uh, re-engaging, sort of regressing in a regressive way, these, these great power contests, which are very unhelpful for the international community, <laughs> as, as, as we all clearly see. Um, so there is a UN Secretary General's process after this statement to follow up. And uh, there's more and more civil society engagement around the world trying to think about how to feed into that process. And there's, there's a very strong uh, campaign uh, through the, the civil society group Democracy Without Borders, uh, which is advocating for a world parliamentary assembly, which is gaining momentum almost by the day where more par parliamentarians around the world are supporting this proposal for a world parliamentary assembly. So, I think uh, while there are indeed, you know, um, these these conflicts among uh, superpowers or the usual suspects uh, uh, in the world, there's also this sort of um, growing capacity of the majority of states around the world who understand that the citizens of the world and the populations of the world and civil society around the world are are their partners, that they have to get new ideas and that. Uh, getting, uh, putting in place mechanisms of more engagement with the people of the world, the citizens of the world, parliamentarians of the world will be in their best interest because they will support healthy multilateralism. So uh, one example uh, of, of these kind of states around the world who, who are, are starting to work together, who, who, who are not craving power or dominance, but uh, advocating for cooperation is the Alliance of Multilateralism, or sorry, Alliance for Multilateralism started by France and Germany, which now has dozens of states around the world that are collaborating on, on, on shared values and shared projects. But this unfortunately doesn't always make the news <laughs> uh, because it's not so uh, dramatic, uh, but it's, it's incredibly positive uh, steps towards very strong, collective shared leadership and, and global cooperation for better global governance. Thank you, so, so interesting. Um, I, I, if, you, if you guys also have any questions, please <laughs> of, of each other, please uh, raise your hands. But another question I had, um, which uh, hasn't been highlighted in any of the comments, um, was in, in the document, uh, it talks about the importance of an ethical framework for uh, global governance. And so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And if you can talk a little bit about this ethical framework and how it relates to building an effective uh, world governance system or, or, or creating more effective governance structures, because obviously the statement is about effective governance structures going forward. And, and then there is a paragraph about this ethical framework and the need for it and the, and, and the need for um, this ethical dimension also in conversation. So I wanted to see if you can speak a little bit to that. Well, you know, just this morning in Iceland, they began a three day meeting on, on on faith and nature, and with you know the ecumenical patriarch from Constantinople, or the Pope's you know senior representative, uh, many religious leaders talking about the ethical values behind protecting nature, responding to the biodiversity challenge, and so on. You know the Pope has just come out with another encyclical on it, where he talks about the need for multilateralism, and so so I think we're seeing many of those most concerned about ethical interests. And of course, the Baha'i community is, is another of those that's long been pushing for these values that, that are saying, this is an important complement to the technical discussions on governance issues. 
because it's not the intellectual understanding that makes people change their behavior. You need to touch their heart, their emotions in some way. And, and I, that's where going to those values that are shared by many traditions, whether they're secular or religious, or philosophical, but that look at humanity as one whole. I think that's the fundamental ethical center of, of the, B, B, the BIC statement and many others, acknowledging our oneness as a single human race with all the responsibilities that that implies. Uh, we can then bring together these different partnerships and different voices all saying we, we need to acknowledge that the present economic system looking only at profit is very unethical in many of its impacts on human rights. And we need to find other ways of going forward to get away from you know, the extremes it has created you know, in, in the world today. If I could follow up on Arthur's statement, um, in, the, in the statement from the, from the Baha'i international community, there is a reference to how progress for all is not attainable, and I'm quoting, if material advancement is divorced from spiritual and ethical advancement. And uh, I'd just like to sort of comment briefly on this. For people who have studied the, the roots of the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, you know, beyond issues of regulation and the, the sort of the prudential framework for the, for the, for the financial system, um, there is a, 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 a sense, a consensus, I could say, that ethical and moral failings were very much at the core of, of that crisis. In fact, I remember a piece written by Amartya Sen, who is, uh, you know, a world-renowned economist, a Nobel laureate, um, a few months into the crisis, in the Financial Times, where he reminded us that Adam Smith, you know, who is seen as the sort of the founder of, of, of uh, our understanding of economic theory, in a book that he wrote a couple of hundred years ago called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he said that at the center of an effective system of economic governance um, were virtues uh, such as prudence, uh, public spirit, moderation, and, uh, and thereby, you know, he made the case that without these virtues, um, the, the economy would not work in an, effective, in an effective fashion. And 200 years later, we had a dramatic uh, example of that in the crisis of 2008, 2009. So, so that's obviously one example where ethics and, and spiritual principles are tremendously important in terms of the practical operation of our systems of governance. The other example that comes to mind is the whole debate currently taking place about what to do about income inequality. And when you actually look at the kinds of solutions that are being put forward by economists and by, by sort of innovative thinkers, you come to things like, you know, reforming the tax system, making it more, more uh, difficult for uh, corporations and individuals to evade their tax obligations through through tax havens and so on. And the idea that you know, there needs to be an underpinning of solidarity in the operation of the, of, the, of the global economy as a way of addressing some of these injustices which lead to extremes of wealth and poverty and so on. So uh, very much, uh, uh, I think that, that uh, you know, without a solid foundation of ethic and moral principles, no system is going to operate in, 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 in practice. Uh, it will fail as, in fact, our systems have failed precisely because of ethical and, and spiritual uh, shortcomings and failures over the last many hundreds of years. Yes, um, and I, I would, of course, absolutely agree with that. Um, and, and echo the very practical um, consequences of having sound, strong ethical frameworks. Um, and in, 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 the, in terms of global governance processes or and strengthening global governance, which I agree with Arthur is an ethical 
imperative and, and a practical imperative now. Um, maybe I would uh, focus on, on three, three layers or three uh, aspects of these ethical frameworks. Firstly, uh, within global populations, you know, all of us around the world now, as illustrated by this pandemic, we have to become really aware of, of how connected uh, uh, we are, how uh, that we share a common fate, basically, and that if we don't indeed care about others, if we don't think about others in various parts of the world, uh, we will suffer the consequences of, of neglecting the well-being of people or regions or country, specific countries. So um, I already think the foundations for you know, heightened global empathy are there. They're really growing despite, even despite the divisive sort of media influences and those who are trying to foment division, you do have people around the world who do feel more connected and empathetic with all those around the world. And it's very practically important that we realize uh, that we should care about others and care about, therefore, our global governance uh, structures uh, in order to take care of all of us. And I think that's where a leap needs to be taken with global publics around the world to understand the importance of strengthening the charter and to, to make sure we have the global institutions that are equal to these current challenges. Secondly, I think ethical frameworks, of course, are so necessary for all those individuals who are currently involved in global governance institutions, uh, and in particular state representatives, um, and those who work in, 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 in uh, international organizations. And in our book, we have a whole chapter on education and another chapter on principles and values. Well, and, and part of that is really about how do you form international civil servants, again, that have this perspective of caring for everybody, of, of taking care of the whole international community, also in, a, in an ethical way. So populations don't have to worry about you know, bureaucratic excess or corruption or misuse of, of funds or resources that people are really devoted to excellence in their jobs, in, in deploying, uh, their, their institutions to solve these problems in an effective, efficient way. Third point, another layer is the ethical framework that's contained in, in the charter, <laughs> you know, living side by side as, as good neighbors, practicing tolerance. This is a profoundly ethical uh, framework that we have the fortune <laughs> to, to possess already in, uh, from, since 1945, and if, if all of, st of, of, of the states, member states of, of the United Nations ha had lived by these ethical principles with fidelity, uh, we would be in a completely different world right now, which is quite interesting just, just to think about that. Um, and, and now, okay, we, those uh, of us who, who, who are, 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 are anxiously concerned <laughs> about uh, our, our, our global fate, um, now we have to think about, okay, how do we better implement these, these, these uh, priceless principles in the charter? How do we enforce and implement international law, for example, so that there, there's a pervasiveness of these shared values? These are shared values of, of, of basically every nation in the world, 193 states are members of the United Nations. That's the whole, almost the entire uh, uh, world, uh, all of human society. So how do we actually strengthen and give greater life and uh, uh, substance to these ethical principles that were already adopted uh, in 1945? Yeah, and, and just to add, I think what many people don't realize is that um, many of the policies in place, many things that we do even if they are, you know, as the statement itself says, even if they're purely material, have some underlying moral and ethical principles uh, behind them. Um, and so I, I, think, I think that's something that we don't realize that either, you know, whether we realize it or not, everything that we do is, is founded on certain um, ethical um, and, and moral uh, assumptions uh, about human nature. Um, Thank you. I don't know if any of you have any other questions. 
or comments. It doesn't have to be questions. I think it's wonderful to have these statements for the Baha'i national community that help to frame our challenges. They're relatively short, uh, but they're really quite deep in the, the reflections they give, and they can inspire us to you know, work harder to put them into practice. Uh, I think it's, this is an important contribution that the Baha'i community can make to the discourses of society and can show that there are positive ways forward. It's all not all negative. Which is, we need more hope in the world today. And this kind of message can give that to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I know you're all very, very busy. So thanks for um, giving us the time to kind of unpack some of the concepts in the statement. Um, and hopefully we can have you again sometime.